want to cover the subject, how old was Hazrat Aisha when she married the Holy Prophet? Now, uh, I presume many of you have faced this question. It is a very common uh, objection that's raised. So, uh, first of all, I want to try and see how you would answer it. And then I'll put uh, whatever we've got on the screen here. Now, this has come about because of one hadith who has related that the Holy Prophet Muhammad married Hazrat Aisha when she was six years old and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old. This is taken from the book Bukhari, which of course is the most authentic of all the hadith books. And the objection, of course, is that how come the Holy Prophet uh, married Aisha so young but more importantly, consummated the marriage when she was only nine years old. And uh, they will say, go as far as to say that even the Holy Prophet is a paedophile for doing such a thing. So how would anybody answer this? So I'm going to put it first of all to yourselves to see if anybody can answer this objection. Maybe they have answered it. So what would they say? So, does anybody want to say anything? Thanks. Um, so, Masa, are you, was it good to say something? Um, yeah. Assalamualaikum. Well, I think uh, it was somewhere I read that uh, her age wasn't uh, on nine years, it was uh, more like uh, 12 or 13 or even 14 years of age uh, when really um, marriage was, um, he, she got married and it was uh, consummated. But how are you going to prove that? I mean, we can pluck any age, say, well, oh, she was 30. Yeah, but, this uh, is what, what I, I read somewhere. I can't uh, give you the reference. Uh, it was in, in um, I think, uh, uh, you were review of religion. There was an article there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so anybody else? How would anyone answer this object uh, if it was raised and that, uh, according to the Hadith, she was nine years old? So, um, has anybody got any way of uh, object, uh, answering this, or shall I give the answer? Um, Rabbi, I just wanted to ask: Did you say that? Is it says in the Hadith that she was nine years old? Is that? Yeah, you can see the hadith in front of you. It's taken from the book of Kavi. Um, so, as we said, this is the most authentic of all the hadith books. Um, and this is where they get this from. I've seen it in Bukhari, and uh, obviously it's a well-known hadith. So, how would we answer it? But does it not say six there? Or... She was married at six. She had the nikah at six, and she had the walima at nine. In Islam, as you know, there are three stages to the marriage. So nikah can happen at any time. And that's fine. Uh, marrying at six, sometimes they marry at a baby. Uh, that's here or there. Uh, and then you have the wukstana, where the girl is taken away. Uh, and then you have the walima, where the marriage is actually consummated. Now, um, we've had this discussion before with some uh, scholars. <laughs> Uh, about what is a walima. Um, but a walima, actually, the true meaning of a walima is that is to mark the consummation of a marriage uh, by a feast, of course. But um, in the early days, they uh, used to hang the bed sheet out the window to prove that it's been consummated. Um, but generally, what Islam says is that uh, if only when the marriage is consummated uh, do you pay the full uh, hakmer. If the marriage is not being consummated, you only have to pay half the hakmer, depending on why the divorce is happening. So actually, when people have this ulima, this feast, they should understand that what they're actually doing is declaring to the world that the marriage has been consummated. Now, I remember one time uh, we had this uh, Islai committee and a person said that our marriage hadn't been consummated. And I said, well, did you have a woman? They said, yes. 
I said, well, then how do we know? Uh, the fact that you had the ulema detail, uh, tells everyone that the marriage has been consummated. So this is actually the reason for the ulema. I know everyone enjoys a nice feast, but <laughs> the feast is really there because it's been consummated. So in this hadith, Uwa has declared that she had the marriage consummated when she was nine years old. And this is where the objection comes that how can a nine year old be, uh, be a marriage and be consummated? And that's why I say they call them say that the Holy Prophet was a pedophile because he had relations with a nine year old. So that's the objection. Um, I presume people have faced it, but how do we answer it? I remember uh, once um, we was also having a uh, tablig discussion. I think it was a couple of weeks back when uh, we we just briefly, I think, we touched up on this point. And I think, as I remember, uh, we, we 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 discussed that basically um, at that time. Um, you know, this is fourteen, fifteen hundred years ago. Uh, uh, puberty was something that came very early, and um, uh, that time. Um, <clears throat> You know, it was coming at a very early age than now, apparently. That's something that I do remember. So, just if that's to... possible, we see in, for instance, and in some in the Holy Quran that declares that Noah was 950 years old, other people lived to be 900 years old. Is it possible in those days? How can they live so long where now we can't? And how can a girl at the time of the Holy Prophet? be mature at nine years old and in this day and age they can't do it so that really is not a good answer do you think it's a good answer what like uh someone being nine 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 hundred years old no i'm saying that some uh bible says that or the quran says that someone was 900 years old yeah obviously yeah. we don't see people 900 years old we know that when the person reaches 100 120 maybe um, so how can it be that in those days suddenly someone lived so long? So like your argument here is that 1500 years ago, a girl could have reached uh, maturity at nine years old, whereas now suddenly they can't do it. So I think that won't be accepted as an argument. I wouldn't accept it anyway, let's put it that way. Okay, so okay. anybody else got any views? Uh, I found okay, you're echoing a lot. So maybe you've got two devices going. You on the same way. Can hear. And, uh, so, so, can I answer your question now? Yeah, that's better. Uh, all right, so my answer to your question is uh, we need to look at the history of when Hazrat Muhammad was married to Aisha. And when they consummated, obviously. Hmm. So it was probably Aisha was born before the Hijrat of Hijrat to Medina. And, the, and after the Hijrat, they were married. So the history says she would be probably around 18 years old or 19 years old because Hijrat took place and before she was born and the ages of her. Uh, her sisters, so history teaches us that Prophet Aisha was probably around 18 to 19 years old when she was consummated by the Prophet. So I think this is my answer. Right, okay. Um, well, there, that is an answer, but it needs a bit more proof uh, again if people wanted to say, well, based on what? I mean, yes, as what Aisha. Um, obviously got married with the Holy Prophet Muhammad uh, Sassam at the Hijra. Um, when the Holy Prophet, just before the Hijra, his wife Khadija passed away. So they advised that uh, she, he should uh, get married for the young children that he, he had at that time. So he married one lady and he also got engaged or nikah to Hazrat Aisha and that happened after the Hijra happened. But we still need to then work out when was Aisha born. Um, so it needs a little bit more proof, but you're, you're on the right tracks. Okay, let's show what I've got here. So the first thing is that we know Sahih Bukhari is very reliable. Sahih Bukhari, Imam Bukhari himself, he used to, with every hadith, 
he did a thorough check on the chain. You know that Hadith, um, although it was collected about two, three hundred years after the Holy Prophet, they looked at every person that the Holy Prophet said to such and such, who said to such and such, who said to such and such. He checked the chain of everyone to see if the chain was complete, if there was any doubts about any of the people, and only when he was satisfied that a chain was strong, then he did two rakats and he put it into his book. In this way, he actually rejected hundreds and thousands of hadith and only put those that were true or the chain was strong in his book. And that's why he is number one in the hadith um, that we say because of the thorough check that he did. So the book, Bukhari, is a very reliable book in the hadith. As I said, he's checked the chain to ensure that the people are completely worthy, trustworthy. There's no problems there. Concerning Orwa, he found him to be very trustworthy. And this is why he included his hadith in the books. So we see that A, Bukhari is a very reliable uh, hadith collection book and that Urwa himself was also very reliable. So there's no doubt about the actual hadith. But there is doubt about Urwa's age. What we say was that when he narrated this and we got to understand that there's only this hadith that they fall on. Um, and Urwa at that time was very old. Now we know that age is age. Obviously, the older you get, the more difficult it is to recall things. So whilst he himself was known to be very trustworthy in the Hadith, this particular Hadith, he was of quite old age. And we also know that at that time, there was no record of birth, marriages, or anything like that. So you can't be sure. It's, I mean, even these days, obviously in Pakistan and things like that, they've only just started putting records of birth and things like this. So there was no way to confirm it. And so it's only from his own memory. And he was old at that time. Mistakes can happen. He knew that Aisha was young. How old? We don't know. So what we do know, the fact is that according to Islam, you have to be mature to have the marriage consummated. We don't allow that a, a pre uh, person who's mature can have marriage consummated. So only once maturity is there, then the marriage has to be consummated. And so therefore we know that when the Holy Prophet Muhammad did consummate this marriage, Aisha had to be mature. How old? We don't know, but we know she had to be mature because that is obviously uh, the way in Islam and the Holy Prophet knows Islam better than anyone else. Now we also know that nature uh, is the thing that determines whether a person gets mature or not. It's not for government. This government in the UK, they have declared that anyone at 16 years old or under 16 years old, they are not to get married. That's a government. That's their rules. But nature is a different thing. And we see that even in this country, although they've got this fixed rule, 16 years old, many, many girls have relationships before 16 Many girls get pregnant and are unmarried mothers at a very early age. So that's nature. So nature itself will determine when a girl uh, is at the age for consummating the marriage and not a government as such. So we see in this country even that a mature, a girl can be mature at 12, 13 years old. There are quite a number of girls, unfortunately, in this country who have babies at that age. Uh, it may be true in hotter countries, it may be even earlier than that. Um, so as I said, it's really up to nature itself to determine when a girl is mature or not. In this country, there were kings who got married to 12 year olds. Obviously going back in time, but still at 12 years old, the kings got married to uh, uh, the king got married to 12 year old girls. So we see through history that even kings of this country used to get married to 12 year olds and things like this. But as I said, this law has been only made in recent times. Now, 
we understand that there seems to be a three-year gap. According to Uwa, he felt that there was a three-year gap between the Nikah and the um, consummating. Based on this, maybe Aisha could have been nine, and three years later, at 12, she could have been mature enough for uh, the marriage to be consummated. So maybe he's got mixed up from six to nine to nine to 12, maybe. But as has been mentioned, the facts, that's what we've got to look at, the facts. How can we prove this? We have this one hadith, which we, although it's a very reliable hadith book, we have some doubt over that he himself was of old age. He may not have realized how old Aisha was, bearing in mind also that the Purda came in at that sort of time as well, and she would have been observing Purda. And so obviously this person who's recording this hadith at an old age may have made some uh, facts wrong. The facts seem to indicate that Aisha wasn't even 12 years old, she was more likely that she was around 15 at the time, or as has just been mentioned, facts could indicate that she was actually 19 or 20. So how can we prove this? We know that Hazrat Abu Bakr, he had four children which were born from his two wives, and these were all pre-Islamic period. So um, I think Juned was near right here, but he got a little bit confused. Basically, we know that it wasn't the Hijra, but it was actually before Islam started that all these children were born. So we know this. So we know that Aisha was also born before Islam, so uh, before 610 uh, AD, because obviously the Holy Prophet was 40 years old when he got his first revelation, and he was born in 570, so that makes it uh, 610 when Islam started. But his children were already born at, before then. So that is a fact, we know that, we can use that as history. Hazrat Aisha's marriage to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sassim took place one year after Hijrah, the emigration of Medina, uh, or around two, 624. We know, again, that after Islam started, the Holy Prophet was uh, 10 years in uh, um, uh, Mecca, and then went to uh, Medina. So these are facts that we know that the Hijra, as I said, the Holy Prophet, his wife Khadija died after the free air boycott that uh, happened. Uh, both Abu Talib and uh, Khadija died in the same year. People were saying that you've got four children, four young children, you need to get married again. And so the Holy Prophet married his first or his second wife, which was Soda, and he also got married to Hazrat Aisha. But that was when they moved now to uh, Medina. So it means that if Hazrat Aisha had been born as late as 609 AD, only a year before the Holy Prophet claimed prophethood, she would have still been roughly about 14 years at the time of the immigration to Medina in 623. This is a fact. So this is what we can call on. You know, I mean, we got this hadith, but it's not according to the known facts that we can call on. So therefore, no less, sorry, so no less than 15 at the time of a marriage to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, which obviously is a far cry from six years old. So we know that even in this country, 15 year old uh, is well too. Now, again, uh, I think it was maybe yourself said, or someone mentioned, uh, maybe it was Solomon Saab, about her sister. And this is another fact. Has a, uh, asthma, was the elder sister of the Hazrat Aisha. We know at the time of the Hijra, it was I, uh, Asma who took the food to uh, Holy Prophet and Abu Bakr in the cave, took her belt off uh, a cord, cut it in half to tie the food. And so she's known by this name uh, of having two belts. So the fact is that Asma was 10 years older 
than Aisha. That's a fact, we know that. Now, based on that, we know that Hazrat Asma died at the age of 100 in 73 AD. So that's 900, uh, 695 AD. This is a fact that we know. What that means then is that Hazrat Asma must have been no younger than 27 years old at the time of the emigration. Based on when she died, we can work that out. After working out that she was 27 years old and she was 10 years older than uh, Aisha, then it means that Aisha would have been about 17 years old at the time of the marriage, um, which, as we said, was in 1 AD or some sources say 2 AD. So Hazrat Asma would have been 28, which means that Aisha must have been a minimum 18, 19 years old when consult, consenting marriage to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu But these are facts that we can uh, go, turn to, and that helps to support that this hadith, we don't say it's wrong, we don't say it's false, we just say that maybe he was old at the time and couldn't remember it. Like I said, there was um, Purda. Aisha, from the reports, was very young, very thin as such, and so how is he going to really know the age of Aisha? So this is, we think, Zoo. just uh, he's off the top of his head, he said something, but the actual facts prove something else. Okay, Solomon Saad, you've got your hand up, so would you like to say something? Yes, I just want to ask, uh, just, sorry, oh, yes, just wanted to ask, um, the fact you mentioned that uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr, had all his, his uh, four children before the advent of his, his before Islam. the advent of Islam. Mm. You said this is a fact. Is there a reference? Can you give us any reference for that? And really, <laughs> how do you prove that? Um, the reference I haven't got the reference. Uh, um, I presume it's either come from Sirat or it's come from Adith, but. Uh, this is what we understand. Um, so I don't know where I'd find that reference. Um, mm. So I couldn't be able to find it. But as far as we understand, this is the thing that uh, he had all his children before Islam, uh, before Islam came. So I don't know. It must be, it was either Sirat or, as I said, it would have been um, maybe um, in the Hadith. Um, but somewhere it's recorded this. And so this is where our scholars have got the information from. Okay, exactly. Okay, uh, Juned has written, before we move forward on this, my question is why Imam Bukhari, didn't use his vast knowledge of facts and figures in determining of the strength, health of his hadiths and say, was, uh, I said it was nine. Okay. Um, Again, this is something useful, a very good question about Hadith. Imam Bukhari, he checked the chain. He made sure that each person who narrated it, that was solid. There was no break in the chain. So Abu Bakr said, so, uh, Holy Prophet said something, Abu Bakr heard it, he told Umar, he told Uthman, he told Ali, the chain is there. He, Bukhari is not going to be a judge and jury. He's not going to determine whether it's right or not. He's simply saying that the chain is strong. This is why we find in Bukhari itself, Hadith which says that you should drink when sitting down. And the next Hadith says you should drink when standing up. How can they contradict each other? The fact is that the chain was strong for sitting down. The chain was strong for standing up. So he's put both there and said, you judge. It could be that that person who was sitting down drinking was fine at the time. There were some problems, and that's why the Holy Prophet told him to sit down and drink. And it could be that when the person was standing up at that particular time, uh, there was some occasion and why the Holy Prophet said stand up and drink. This is the problem with Hadith. It doesn't say what happening around at the time, what caused that thing to be said. It just gives you the Hadith. So this is what we see with Bukhari. Again, 
we see uh, about the description of Jesus, that in one hadith it states that he was such and such, and in the next hadith he was completely different. Now we of course would say, well, one was relating to Jesus and one was relating to Thomas Messiah, but Bukhari is not going to be the judge. And that's what you need to understand when it comes to hadith, because a lot of people will question hadith. Our criteria, and it should be always there, is that no hadith should contradict the Holy Quran. That's the main criteria. Hadith is just a collection of the sayings, and it doesn't matter whether it's in Bukhari or it's in an unknown hadith book. It's hadith, it's a collection, it's something there to look into. But we don't hold it to be that solid. No hadith, we say, is 100% solid. We just say that there is the Sahih Sitta, who are the six most authentic hadith collectors and who have made the best efforts. That's why they're known as the six most authentic. But that's only the effort to collect the hadith. They're not going to judge whether it is true or not. So I'm sure that in this case, uh, obviously, um, Bakari must have thought, well, this is wrong. But he knew that Uwa was solid. There was nothing wrong he could find. He didn't find any hadith where Uwa lied. So he's not going to judge it. He's not going to say, well, it seems wrong. Therefore, I'm not going to put it in. He's going to say the chain is right. You make up your minds. So that's why we, when it comes to certain hadith, we have to look at other sources for information. And this is what we're doing here. We're looking at history, surat, and looking at the history to determine whether this can be right. If we look at the Holy Quran, as I said, we know the Islamic teachings is that you cannot consummate the marriage unless maturity is there. So there's no way the Holy Prophet would have uh, consummated the marriage with Aisha at nine years old because it's very doubtful that she would have been mature. I don't believe it could be that hot in those days that made a girl more mature than these days. It's still hot in Arabia. But the facts, that is something else. And so we turn to other facts. So the fact that Bukhari mentioned it, yes, it means the chain was good. It doesn't mean that Hadith is good. It just means the chain is good. And as we said, that chain all were, he was solid, but at that time of the rating, he was old. Recording something that happened maybe years, 30, 40, 50 years beforehand. And there was a Purda situation. Uh, mistakes can easily happen. And that's the problem with Hadith. That's why we do not put more emphasis on Hadith than the Quran. It cannot go against the Quran. Okay, any other comments or anything anybody wants to say? Asalaamu Alaikum. Welcome, Islam. Uh, Tahir Sahib, it's Nasir Chaudhary here. Yes. Uh, th there's another uh, uh, point of view to look at this early age marriage issue that uh, the, uh, from the medical point of view, I mean, the latest medical research has proved that the age of puberty is possible around 10 or a little under 10. So that's what the medical research says, that in some parts of the world, uh, the early puberty around the age of 10 is possible. And if we look from a legislation point of view, in America, the marriage age is determined as 16 years. In India, it is 19 years. Uh, sorry, 18 years. And in Indonesia, it is 19 years. And even in America, where generally it is uh, 16 years, in Texas, it is legislated as 14 years. So that, uh, um, and again, from medical point of view, it has been researched that the areas closer to the equator, there the uh, girls get puberty much earlier beside having other contributing factors like uh, diet and surroundings and uh, uh, the atmosphere and weather and all these things, climate and all these things. So uh, it, it uh, even at the age of, if we take it for granted that uh, she was consummated at, uh, uh, marriage was consummated at the age of nine, 
it's not uh, something which uh, the science rules out. Um, yeah, I mean, in America, even I think it, it's, it was 12 years old in some states. Um, and as I said, we know even in this country that children do have babies at 12 years old. That's a fact we know this. So, but that, like I said, we don't need to really go down the avenue of whether she was mature at nine. That's, that is pressing it. Okay. Facts show otherwise. We, we've got plenty of facts to prove that this is not the case. So okay. I would prefer to go more to this than saying, well, yes, uh, it could be possible. But as I said, if you're going to go down that avenue, the Holy Prophet Mumsen would not have consummated the marriage unless she was mature. This is what Islam teaches. So yes, we know that Aisha was mature, whether she was 9, 12, 18, or whatever age she was. So, but I would think it's better to answer with these sort of facts that we've got according to the history. But yes, it, it is possible. Okay, exactly. anybody else, uh, anything, or should we move on to the yeah. next uh, topic? Okay, everybody's happy now. Right, let's uh, go to the next one. And um, this is so I wanted to bring into because obviously we have um, Eid coming up very shortly. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, but there is this question of who got sacrificed. Was it Hazrat Ishmael or Hazrat Isaac? So, um, as I said, it is something which a lot of Muslims would take granted that um, Hazrat Ishmael uh, was the child. But the Jews, they themselves claim that the child sacrifice was actually Hazrat Isaac. And according to the Bible, it relates that it was Isaac who was a baby who was the one that got sacrificed. So what do we say? How do we answer this? How can we prove that it's Hazrat Ishmael who got sacrificed and not Hazrat Isaac? Now, quiet again. Has anybody faced this question? Assalamualaikum. Sorry, Mabhi sir, but I haven't. I uh, faced this question even if it's new for me. <laughs> I didn't listen anything about that. Uh, that the Jews hmm. believe that the Hazrat Isaac was the child of Hazrat Ismail al Islam. Oh. So I haven't faced that question. Never ever. <laughs> well, uh, now you know. Uh, this is what the Bible claims. So it's very clear in the Bible that it was a baby and that it was Isaac according to the Bible. So how do we answer this and then how can we prove? Is it just we say it is or can we prove it that it's as a Ishmael and not as a Isaac? Uh, actually it's totally new for me so I don't know how to we reply okay. on that no question. Uh, I would like to answer this question. Yes, please. Jamil uh, Khan uh, here. So. Okay, you've got a lot of echo. I don't know why you've got a lot of echo. But I'm in a bus actually, so that is why I think I have this echo here. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, I'm traveling right now, so uh, I will answer this question. I, uh, we have to look at the facts because hmm. uh, uh, this uh, sacrifice ritual, uh, the timing and the execution, we need to look at these facts from the history because uh, when Ibrahim he prayed to Almighty Allah about for his son, so Allah gave him this blessing of Hazrat Ismail, and then after when Hazrat Ismail uh, grew older and something, so he saw in his dream that Allah was asking him for a sacrifice to sacrifice his son. So the history says that at the time of this dream and everything. It was her Ismail and not her Ishaq. So I would answer this question on the basis of history and its facts that it was certainly her Ismail 
and the location of this uh, this narration of this dream and everything it proves that uh, ismail not her is hard does the holy quran say it was ismail uh, no nah, i don't think so no it doesn't the thing is as we're saying we know the holy quran talks about this conversation between hazrat ibrahim and ismail but the bible takes a different conversation there it says that uh, uh, Abraham was told to sacrifice um, Isaac as a baby. Now, obviously, uh, if we look at the Jewish point of view, they will say that Hagar, the wife of Abraham, who we say was the wife of Abraham, was not the wife of Abraham. The Jews don't believe that she was the wife of Abraham. They say she was a bondswoman. She was a slave girl. And it was a uh, illiterate marriage uh, or not, it was a literate child, Ishmael. So therefore, this is not the child. They don't recognize that child. They only recognize Isaac. That's the true Jewish point of view. And when you face this, you're going to be, it's going to be the Jews or the Christians who's going to bring up this argument. So how do we answer it? Quiet. <laughs> No one's got anything else I have to say? So I go for the facts then? Okay, right. Um, so let's see what we've got. As I said, the Jew claimed that the child sacrifice was Isaac. The Muslims claimed that the child sacrifice was Ishmael. So which child was it that was sacrificed? So of course, if you go, as I said, to the chronic sources, although it doesn't say Ishmael, we believe it was Ishmael. If you go to the Bible, on the other hand, then it's very really clearly saying it was Isaac as a baby. So what are the facts? This is what we have to turn to, the facts to prove this. We know that Hazrat Ibrahim had two children from his first two wives. He had more wives, he had more children. But we are only concerning these two, Isaac and Ishmael. So the fact is that we know that Hazrat Ishmael came from the wife of Hazrat Hagar. That's a clear fact. No one's disputing that. We also know that Hazrat Isaac came from his first wife, Hazrat Sarah. A clear fact, no doubt about that. We also know that Hazrat Ibrahim salam, was commanded to slaughter his only son. This is from the Bible. This is what the Bible says, that he should slaughter his only son. Now, Hazrat Ishmael was born 13 years before Hazrat Isaac. This is also in the Bible. It's very clear. No one's going to doubt this. It is a fact that Hazrat Ishmael uh, was 13 years older than Isaac. So it means, going back to this previous one, that both children... Where is it gone? I'll go back. Right. It means that Hazrat Ibrahim was commanded to slaughter his only son. This is the important thing, only son. Now, as we've just shown that Isaac, uh, sorry, Isaac was born 13 years younger or before, uh, after Ishmael. So therefore, for 13 years, Hazrat Ishmael was the only son. That's a fact. We also know that both children, both Ishmael and Isaac, according to the Bible, buried Hazrat Ibrahim. They both were there buried. So it means that whilst Hazrat Ibrahim was alive, Ishmael was the only child. Isaac never had an opportunity to be a child because Ibrahim, uh, uh, Ishmael, survived to bury Hazrat Abraham. That's a fact. So the fact then remains that Isaac was never the only son. And this is how we should answer this thing. But as I said, the Jews claimed that Hazrat Ishmael was born from a slave girl. And therefore, because she was a slave girl, they do not recognize Hazrat Ishmael as a legitimate son. He has no rights at all. This is what the Jews will answer, how they will answer this. Whereas we, the Muslims, claim that actually she was a gift from the Egyptian king, 
uh, who he married. Now, this, there's some confusion in the Bible about this particular story because it mentions twice how Abraham in the Bible went to Egypt and met the kings. And this idea of telling the king that his wife was his uh, sister in case he had affairs. At that time, Sarah was uh, about 86, I think it was. So there should be no fear that the king would have um, fallen in love with his, uh, his wife or something like that. So the story itself is not clear in the Bible. But still, what we say is that the king gave, uh, Sarah, uh, gave Hagar to, the Holy, uh, to Ibrahim and he married her. That's what we understand. Now, again, coming to the Bible, and also the son of a bondsman, will I make a nation because he is thy seed. This is referring to Ishmael, that also the son of the bondswoman of Hagar, Ishmael, I will make a nation because he is thy seed. What this means is that God recognizes has a Ishmael as Abraham's son, and not only recognizes, but will make him a nation. So as he blessed Isaac, he also blessed Ishmael. This is clear from the Bible. You can quote the Bible and show this is what your book says. Now, again, this is about the bondswoman. The Bible relates, if a man has two wives, one beloved, and one hated, and they have both borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, bearing in mind that the Jews say that the firstborn in this case was that which was hated, what this was Hagar. So the Bible continues, then it shall be that when he makes the sons to inherit that which he has, it's old English, but anyway that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. So according to the law in the Bible, it makes it very clear that it doesn't matter whether you like one and you hate the other. Firstborn is the firstborn. You can't take that away. That firstborn is in, uh, entitled to inherit. So if they use this excuse that Hagar was a bondswoman, so uh, Ishmael was not recognized as a son, uh, not the firstborn, their own Bible goes against this, and their own Bible says it makes no difference. If she is the, if he's the bond, if, if he's a firstborn, whether he comes from one that you hate or whether he comes from the light, if he's the firstborn, so he is the firstborn, you cannot take that away from him. This is what the Bible states. So, has Ibrahim considered Ishmael his son and included him in his covenant with God by getting him circumcised? Now, as I hope you know, this was something where Allah told Abraham that the firstborn, uh, all the children from the age of eight should get, uh, eight days should get circumcised. And Ishmael at that time was 13 years old. So Isaac was just getting born, and he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. This is what the Bible states. So it means that Abraham considered Ishmael his son and got him circumcised, as so he became part of this covenant. And bearing in that in mind, it is from this covenant, which continued through the line of Ishmael, through the Arabs, up to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, no law came to abolish this circumcision. That's why it continues to this day. That's why we also get circumcised because of this covenant. Now, coming back to that covenant, it's also an important thing to, especially when you're talking about Christians, because they don't get circumcised. God has said in the Bible that those that are not circumcised, they're cut off from God. So this was a very important covenant. And Abraham got obviously both his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, circumcised. Now, coming back to, again, more facts. Arabs, pre-Islam, celebrated this great sacrifice as part of the pilgrimage. 
So before Islam came along, before the Holy Quran came along, the Arabs were still celebrating the fact that it was Ishmael who has come from the line. It was Ishmael that got sacrificed before Islam. Since Islam, Muslims celebrate this great sacrifice every year at Eid al-Azhar. We know that this is part of the sacrifice that we celebrate at Eid al-Azhar. But the Jews do not celebrate it. Why not? If they truly believe that Isaac was a one, why don't they celebrate this? But Muslims do, and the Jews don't. Now, why then, why is it mentioned in the Bible that it was Isaac as a baby that was sacrificed? For that, we have to go to the mystery for the Jews, that who wrote the Bible? And it was the Jews. So they are the ones that put whatever they want to put. We know that the Jews hated the Ishmaelites. So there was a great rivalry between the Ishmaelites and the Israelites. And the Israelites are the ones that are writing the Bible. So obviously, if they want to change it, they want to change it. But alhamdulillah, we've got the Holy Quran, and the Holy Quran is very clear in this matter. Although it doesn't mention Ishmael by name, we know that it was Ishmael. He was a young lad of about eight years old when uh, Abraham said to him that I've seen this dream and I should sacrifice you according to that dream. He agreed and he was about to do it when Allah stopped him and told him that you've already fulfilled that dream. How did he fulfill that dream? He fulfilled that dream because he left his wife Hagar and Ishmael in the barren desert and left them to die as such without any food or drink. That was a sacrifice which Abraham saw in his dream, which he thought it was killing his son, but actually it was that leaving behind. And it was Ishmael that he left behind in the desert, not Isaac. So these are the facts that we present when this uh, comes across. Um, I'm surprised many of you haven't actually uh, had this argument. I thought you had, but anyway, um, it's uh, an argument, but anyway, that's the thing you've got to do. You've got to focus on the only son. And that proves it that it was Ishmael. Okay, anybody got anything to say on that? I think that's it on this one. Yep. So anybody else got anything to say on that? Um, you're very quiet today. I thought these two topics would have um, been raising up some mentions, but anyway. Um, I've got a question. Please, yes. Yeah, um, do Jews and Christians have the same book? Because if the Christians are following the Deut Deuteronomy and the Genesis, aren't they the Jewish books, the books of mm -hmm. are they the Torah? Okay, so what is the Bible? The Bible consists of what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Jewish books. The New Testament is the Christian books. So the question arises, and what I often pose to Christians, is why? Why do you have the Old Testament in the Holy Bible? It's nothing to do with you. It's the Jews. Why is it there? And the problem that the Christians have is that Jesus was a Jewish prophet. And Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. So to understand what Jesus is talking about, they had to include the Old Testament in the New Testament to make the Bible. So this is why it's found in the Holy uh, Bible uh, that Moses' books, the Torah, is found there. But yes, it is, as you rightly said, it's all about the Jews. It's got nothing to do with Christians. But the Christian, because it's part of the book, they still use this in argument. Right. Okay, Jazakallah. So basically the Old Testament is the one that is followed by the Jews, but the Christians uh, follow both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, as we mentioned in the previous uh, discussion, I think we did, Paul, um, what is Christianity? And again, um, obviously, the problem with Christianity is that Jesus was a Jew. He never started Christianity. It's not a religion from God. 
Christianity was started by Paul and it, his teachings. And Paul said that the law was cursed. So all this in the Torah is a Jewish law. And Paul has declared it as cursed. You don't have to follow it. And that's why Christians pick and choose. That's why they don't have this circumcision. A classic example, why they don't get circumcised. If this covenant is so important, instead what the Jew, uh, Christians would do is they say that the, the blood and flesh of Jesus is a new covenant. So that's why they have the bread and wine uh, at the functions. So it's not for man to abolish God's law. This was a covenant between Abraham and God, meaning man and God, and a very important covenant. And that's why Muslims to this day still get circumcised. Jews to this day still get circumcised. Jesus, of course, was a Jew. He got circumcised. And Paul also was a Jew and got circumcised. But this is what Paul did. And that's how Christianity came about. Um, so this is the problem. This is the um, dilemma that Christians have. That on one hand, they say that we have nothing to do with the Jews. On the other hand, everything they do is about Judaism because they've got a Jewish prophet. Okay, anybody else got anything they'd like to say? Uh, uh, actually, I have a question. But like Hazrat Ismail al Islam, in the, in the Jews' eyes, what, how, what respect they give in Hazrat Ismail al Islam? None. No. <laughs> The Jew, as I said, the Jews hate the Ishmaelites. They, they don't recognize Ishmael as a, uh, a, a, a legal son of uh, Abraham. They don't recognize anything about Ishmael. Um, as far as they're concerned, he's a wild man who Abraham took away into the desert. We got nothing to do with him. They wiped their hands. Of course, for us, we understand that this was actually very important, the two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, because once the Jews had blew it and they lost the right to be the chosen people, that went to their brethren. And that brethren goes back to Abraham and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And that's why we say that this covenant uh, of being a chosen people left the Jews and went to the Muslims because of Ishmael's. But as far as the Jews are concerned, they hate Ishmael. They, they don't recognize him. They don't want anything to do with him. So what about Christians? Uh, they are what they think about other Ismail Islam. Christians, um, yeah, I think it's the same sort of thing. I mean, it's not really an issue for them. They don't recognize Ishmael. Um, they don't recognize Muslims. They don't believe that the uh, blessings transferred from the uh, Jews to the Muslims. They think that it's come to them somehow. Um, how they think they're the brethren, uh, I don't know is best. But uh, as far as they're concerned, they will use this argument, no doubt, that Isaac was the one that was slaughtered because according to the Bible, Old Testament, as I said, that's what written. But um, this is the dilemma that Jew the Christians have, that they quote from the Old Bible, uh, Old Testament, but they don't follow the Old Testament. Okay. Okay, just Okay. Right, any other comments or shall we leave for today? Okay, so um, I think next week I'm going to be busy. Uh, I think I've got a meeting if I remember right. We'll let you know if there's a function next week, uh, if there's a class next week, um, and we'll let you know the topics. If anybody has got anything they want to discuss, I mean, a few of you mentioned here about the relationship uh, of the Christians with the Bible and things like that. So if there's anything particular you want to know, please contact Zaid or Toby, and we'll, like I say, inform you if there's a class next week. I can't remember, I've got a feeling I've got a machine meeting. Okay, so thank you. And uh, as I said before, if there's any further questions anybody has on this particular subject that we covered, please contact again Zaid or Toby and we'll try and answer those for you as well. So let's finish with silent prayer. So if you could please join me in silent prayer. Bismillah.
I'm sorry, I'm doing. Amen. Amen. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.